Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video we're going to talk about Silicon Valley Bank. Before we dig deep into trying to understand how the company crashed and burned, let's talk about the banking industry as a whole. Before I talk about how banks could eventually go bankrupt, let's talk about how they make money. So the main way banks make money is on interest rate spreads. Like most things, it's so much easier to explain through example. So let's say you deposit $10,000 into your Chase bank account and you receive 1% interest. So that means Chase pays you $100 for the entire year in interest. That's 10,000 times 1%. So you still have your $10,000 in your Chase account, but you get $100 of free money. Your neighbor applies for a $10,000 loan from Chase and they pay 8% on that loan. So your neighbor pays Chase $800 for the entire year in interest. $10,000 times 8%. So in this example, the interest rate spread Chase earns is 7%. 8% minus 1%. $700 is not a lot of money, but when you multiply that tens of thousands of times, it really adds up. And this is a really simple example. The spreads could be much wider or much smaller. It all depends on the interest rates the bank charges on their loans and the interest rates they pay on the deposits. Another way banks make money is on float. When you transfer money or buy things, sometimes it takes two or three business days to hit the other account. During those two or three business days, the bank earns interest on that money. And that's how a lot of companies make money. That's how PayPal makes money, Venmo, AliExpress, and banks also charge fees on the different products they offer. This screenshot is directly from Silicon Valley's most recent 10K. It talks about their revenue sources. Our total revenue is comprised of net interest income, which was that example I gave you earlier with the $10,000, and non-interest income. Non-interest income are fees and all the other expenses. So they made $4.5 billion on the interest rate spreads and $1.7 billion on everything else. And they even explain it in the second paragraph. Net interest income is the interest rate spread differences between the interest rates received on loans. So the interest they charge on the loans they give to people. I know there's a lot of businesses that take loans through this company. That's why they're called Silicon Valley Bank. They do lots of businesses with tech companies. So they may be charging these tech companies 8, 10, 12, 15% interest on the loans. And then Silicon Valley pays interest on the deposits. So if you deposit money to a checking or savings account, or you buy a CD, the bank takes that money and lends it out. And they mention our deposits are largely obtained from commercial clients within technology, life sciences, healthcare, private equity, venture capital, etc. Let's talk about the bank's reserve requirements and the FDIC. Let me convey how money is treated when you deposit money into the bank. So when you put money into a savings account, the bank owns the cash. They own it on your behalf. Even though you have access to the cash at any time, the bank technically owns it because you gave them the money. So if you created your own balance sheet, that cash is an asset on your balance sheet. But if you look at the bank's balance sheet, that cash is a liability. It's not an asset. It's money they owe to you. The FDIC set reserve requirements. Say it's a really small bank and they only have $15 million in deposits. That means the bank can lend out all that money, so they don't have to keep any money in-house. If it's a mid-tier bank and they have $100 million in deposits, they only have to keep 3% of that money in-house, and they can lend out the other 97%. And if it's a big bank like Silicon Valley, they have to hold 10% in cash, and they can lend out 90%. So in theory, every bank can go bankrupt. Even if just half the customers want their money out of the bank, the bank can go bankrupt because they don't have that much cash on hand. If you do business with a really stable bank like JP Morgan Chase, you're not really too concerned they're gonna go bankrupt. So it's unlikely half the people will take their money out of JP Morgan Chase's bank accounts. 
But when people are really concerned a bank is struggling, there could be a bank run and lots of people take their money out, forcing the bank into bankruptcy. If you have less than a quarter million in your bank, then you don't really have to worry. The government ensures that. If you deposit $100,000 into a savings account and $100,000 into a checking account, you're in good shape, you're fine. But if you have $150,000 in a savings, $150,000 in a CD, and if that bank goes bankrupt, there's a good chance you're gonna lose $50,000 because they only insure up to $250,000. That's per person and per bank. You can have $200,000 in five different banks for a total of one million and you're fine. But if you have more than $250,000 at one bank, then there's a risk you could lose some of your money. President FDR created the FDIC. He created it during the Great Depression when 9,000 banks went out of business because there was lots of concerns banks were going out of business. So a lot of people took their money out and put it under the mattress. And the way the FDIC gets all the money to back the banks is directly from the banks. The FDIC is like insurance, like car insurance. So the bank funds the insurance pot. You could open up a bank that is not backed by the FDIC which means you don't have to pay any fees to the FDIC, but most people won't bank at your institution. Now let's talk about Silicon Valley on a high level. The company started 40 years ago. It was the 16th largest bank in the United States. It was the second largest bank default ever. And they measure that in terms of asset size. The largest was WAMU during the Great Recession in 2008. Silicon Valley was a big bank, over $200 billion of assets on its balance sheet. This bank going bankrupt is equivalent to Elon Musk going bankrupt. On March 10th, there was a bank run at SVB. Lots of people took their money out of the bank. And as a result of this action, the FDIC took over the bank. So the FDIC moved SVB's insured deposits to a new entity. The new entity the FDIC created was called Deposit Insurance National Bank of Santa Clara. Usually when the FDIC takes over a bank, they move all deposits to another bank, like Bank of America, for instance. But in this case, they created a new entity. But eventually all of Silicon Valley's accounts will go to an operating bank, like Wells Fargo or JP Morgan. In a normal situation, if you had 400 k at Silicon Valley, you would have lost $150,000. So you wouldn't have access to your money for a few days, but eventually you would just go onto the website for the National Bank of Santa Clara to access your $250,000. That's in a normal situation, but this time the FDIC insured 100% of Silicon Valley's depositors. So if you had $10 million with Silicon Valley, you can access all that money. So the FDIC took a big hit. I think they wanted to quell everyone's fears. So they insured everything in this case. The FDIC wanted to avoid more bank runs. So they thought this was a good solution. But who's gonna pay for that money? Because that's a lot of money the FDIC has to pay now because they're insuring everything, not just the first $250,000. And about 90% of the money deposited at Silicon Valley was uninsured. It was above the $250,000 limit. Existing banks are gonna have to foot the bill and probably pay higher fees. And you know who's gonna really pay the higher fees? It's gonna be us. The bank's gonna charge us. But how are banks gonna charge us? How will it affect us, the everyday man? Well, the banks will charge us higher fees, they'll pay us lower interest, and there's a number of other ways for the banks to get money from us. So let me show you day by day how SVB failed. On Wednesday, March 8th, the company announced it had sold securities at a significant loss. We'll talk a little more detail about these securities later, but I'm just giving you the high level now. And since they sold securities at such a big loss, they announced they were gonna issue more stock, dilute the current shareholders. They were planning on raising $2.25 billion by selling more stock to fix their balance sheet. 
These two announcements trigger panic among key venture capital firms. And those individuals at those big venture capital firms told their friends, family, customers to take their money out of Silicon Valley. On Thursday, the stock fell about 60%. On Friday, stock trading was halted, so you couldn't buy or sell the company stock. And trading was also halted on other banks like First Republic, PacWest, and Signature Bank. Also on Friday, FDIC took over Silicon Valley Bank. They put them into receivership. Let's discuss the causes that led to the bank run. The reason they sold securities at such a big loss was all these interest rate hikes the Fed was doing. When interest rates were really low, close to zero, banks loaded up on long-dated treasury securities, which are pretty much safe investments. It's almost risk-free. And then when the Fed raised rates, the value of those assets fell because bond prices work opposite of rates. When rates go up, bond prices go down. And when rates go down, bond prices go up. I wouldn't be too concerned about another Great Depression. Remember in 2008, 2009, when all those subprime mortgage bonds defaulted and hundreds of banks went out of business? In 2009, there were about 140 bank defaults. In 2010, over 150. But in the past five or six years, there's been less than 10. So you can see Dodd-Frank does work. Silicon Valley had a really fragile balance sheet. There were some problems with the loans they provided to these startup companies. Because a lot of the money they were lending were the startups that were losing money. So those companies were really struggling to raise capital and pay back their loan. But that wasn't the big problem that led to this default. Similar to other banks, Silicon Valley purchased lots of mortgage bonds at the top of the market. They were sitting at a massive unrealized loss. To give you somewhat of a similar example, say you bought $100,000 of Amazon stock in the year 2000, and then the dot-com crash, and the stock was down to $5,000. Yes, Amazon stock did decline that much, but most dot-coms went out of business. Let's just pretend you lost your job, you couldn't pay your mortgage, so you were forced to sell all your assets because you needed to file for bankruptcy. So you had to sell your Amazon stock for $5,000. You couldn't wait another five or 10 years for the stock to go back up and you had to sell at a low point. But there's no guarantee Amazon stock will go back to where it was. But pretty much when you buy these mortgage bonds, you're pretty much guaranteed to get your principal back. But there could be a lot of volatility along the way. Most other banks and insurance companies did have similar issues but it wasn't at such a large scale as Silicon Valley's was. Time and time again, there's a common denominator, leverage. These banks, these financial institutions, they use so much leverage, it kills them. This is Silicon Valley's balance sheet at the end of 2022. They had $212 billion of assets, 14 billion of cash, because remember, they don't have to sit on that much cash, only about 10% of their deposits available for sale securities of 26 billion, but the big problem was is held to maturity securities at 91 billion because these investments are supposed to be held to maturity, not sold before maturity. You could of course sell them before maturity, but you do run the risk of taking a big loss. And pretty much the main way you would take a big loss if interest rates increased a lot. Here's a breakdown on the 91 billion of held to maturity securities. Almost all of it, 86 billion, matured after 10 years. And this is a cardinal rule you don't do in banking or finance. You don't invest in long-term securities to fund short-term debt. The short-term debt are those deposits. People could take the money out at any time because everything would have been fine if Silicon Valley didn't have to sell these investments. But they did, which triggered this large loss, which scared investors and that resulted in a bank run. So this goes to show you any bank can go bankrupt. And another bank went bankrupt the same week Silicon Valley, Signature Bank. And I looked at this ratio and I think it was pretty low. The percent of held to maturity securities 
versus assets. I think it was under 10%. But the reason they went bankrupt is all their exposure to the crypto market. But this is just more information for us to look at in the future to identify a potential bankruptcy. I hope you learned something new. Please subscribe, like, comment, talk to you soon.